and we've broken it down into three paces, pieces. There's the, I guess, what I would call almost the information system piece, which was the first piece that, as far as we understand, most of industry started to go after. And then there's, I guess, the plant and equipment piece and all these potential uh, problems with embedded chips and program logic controllers and everything else. Uh, which was the sex second piece which people are really going after. And then there's a third piece which I guess is are those critical features from the external community that may be supplying you that you need to be sure that uh, to reduce your risk. Uh, you know, the ones we can think of are, you know, if you're buying power for your refinery and you don't get power, you've got a real serious problem. To get this uh, accomplished uh, reasonably well, we're going to have to do a lot of sharing. And so, if we can set up some processes and procedures, uh, basically where we can do this uh, cross-sharing, so that if somebody has looked at something and done it and, and resolved it, uh, then we can share that. Somebody else may not have to uh, repeat the, uh, the effort. Again, it's not something that I think uh, by choice we would have elected to have put on the plate of Caltex at this p particular point in time. I think in terms of, of our actual business, there are uh, a number of initiatives and things that we need to do that uh, uh, this would seem to be more of a nuisance. Uh, the only thing I can say, if we do it really well, maybe there's, uh, there's some opportunity in here because some companies uh, won't do it well, and uh, a lot of people will be looking to us, you know, when they start to realize that, whoa, if we don't get petroleum products, we're in trouble. Well, as you all know, um, I think by now, Caltex, I think every part of Caltex has a year 2000 compliance program in place, and you're all part of those programs. And basically what has been happening over the last year, as far as I see it, because Richard and I and Dean are, are relatively new to this, this issue, is that as industry and governments and major <coughs> corporations and all the people that support them have started to realize the possible negative Im implications of the year 2000 issue, which is not just a technical issue, it's a, a business issue, and we keep mentioning year 2000, but what it is, it's a much bigger problem than just the year 2000 itself. It's to do with any date sensitive equipment or software, and it's already started. For example, last year, the US Co Coast Guard had an incident where one of their computer systems basically just locked up, and it remained locked up for three days while they worked out what the problem was. Other companies and other corporations have already started to run into similar problems. And as we approach the year 2000, we feel that there's going to be a much greater incidence of these things happening. And already, Richard will show you later on today, there's, we've got three or four pages of possible dates that people have already identified as causing problems. And then there's the year 2000 itself, but then beyond, up until the second leap year of the next millennium, people are anticipating to have significant occurrences where things that have been missed or misunderstood will leave out the woodwork and bite them. What we want to develop is a, a means of sharing the information between ourselves, sharing it with our customers, and sharing it with our suppliers. From a business point of view, this is, this is what we're really looking at, you know, at the end of the day that Caltex will not suffer any business interruption or any other adverse effect because of, to f of failure to detect and rectify any date sensitive hardware or software. And by this, what we're looking for, that in the year 2000, we will have succeeded if we've had no major business system malfunction, no major manufacturing man malfunction, that's in our lube plants, our LPG bottling plants or in the refineries. There's been no significant accident, there's been no significant supplier or customer out there that has failed to perform, that we're not looking at any litigation as a consequence of the, the year 2000 issue, that Linda's insurance premiums haven't increased, there's been no adverse shareholder reaction, 
either from themselves or from their investors. We've had no adverse comments from the external audit auditors, and not least that we've had no adverse publicity in our local areas. So if we can look at those in two years' time positively, we'll have succeeded. Now the function of the group here, come on in John, you'll be on sir. Basically we've got two roles. The primary role is the is compliance related. And here, and this has been handled primarily by, by Richard, and our objective is to be able to provide enough data to our shareholders so that we can give them comfort and assurance both to our shareholders and the Caltex board that we are effectively managing the business risks <coughs> associated with the year 2000. And in many ways, this is non-discretional. Now, these are the things that we will have to be providing to them. For example, the year 2000 compliance officers within Chevron and Texaco, they look on Caltex as just another business unit to themselves. So Chevron, you know, they look at Chevron chemicals, uh, the, the refining section, the marketing section, and they're putting them through various hurdles which they've got to comply with, and they're going to be looking to us to do exactly the same. Similarly with Texaco, they've got a scorecard which they use to monitor each one of their divisions worldwide, and they're going to have one for us. The secondary role, and this is just... That's not to say that it won't that uh, Dion won't be as busy as Richard is. In the actual fact, as the months pass, he's probably going to be busier. Dion is going to be positioning himself to try and provide services as needed by yourselves in the field, because we see that as the months pass, resources that are available to to help you are already we're already seeing are very very scarce. To provide comfort to <coughs> our board of directors and the shareholders, we're going to or already have developed a consistent criteria for reporting. Um, this is to satisfy our own internal issues, because we have them, and then the external issues of the shareholders and the, the outside entities. And then once we have those established and agreed, and Richard will be covering that later on today, our role will be to monitor against that criteria and report back and, as necessary, help you all if you're running into any difficulties. Even though they don't know what they're going to do, the insurance industry has asked us some questions, which I've had to answer. And I will tell you what these questions were. This is both from the liability side and the property side. They wanted to know whether Caltex, and this is Caltex in the broad sense, has carried out any technical audits. What steps has Caltex or will, taken or will be taken to identify software, hardware, which will not be year 2000 compliant, and when will this be completed? What measures have been taken to correct the problem? When will these measures be completed? And has Caltex obtained written confirmation from its suppliers and customers that their systems are year 2000 compliant? So in conclusion, I would suggest that you progress on this issue in a methodical and consistent manner, that you document your approach with thorough record keeping. Thank you very much. <coughs> <coughs> you perform rigorous tests, make changes as need be, have a contingency, contingency plan in place, and above all, assume that there's no <coughs> insurance coverage available at that time. If you do have a loss, here's what I, I suppose would happen, and this would be the nightmare. If you do have a loss, for some reason your company didn't find everything that could go wrong. If you're a public company, and we are indirectly a public company, the shareholders will first try to show that the board or the executives are liable. They will say that they were negligent in their duty, that they didn't have the fiduciary care that people should show toward other people's money. Or if you made statements that everything is nice and rosy, they could accuse you of fraud. None of those are very pleasant. The government may be interested in liability of the company and its board and officers because of liabilities under the securities law. 
every year public companies have to make 10K statements. And in the 10K statement, there is a, um, like a review of the present and, the, and a forecast of the future by the chief executive. They are now starting about 10% of the 10K forms last year mentioned um, year 2000 problems. And they're, they're being more realistic than in the past. The government might have an interest in showing that because of some hardware fail or some unit fail that toxic fluid, toxic gas was released. You could find yourself with environmental problems. You could find yourself having spillage problems at a terminal if it was, happened to be numerically controlled. And other customers will seek to prove you liable because you failed to provide goods or services and cause them an interruption of business. And there is a reason that the insurance companies are being very cautious right now. They know that if you cause a loss that causes someone loss of profit or loss of business, that is a legal liability. And they don't want to pay a sure thing. If the break occurs in third parties, the company may have losses that it can't recoup from the, from the wrongful party because maybe their losses were so significant that they went bankrupt. Or maybe they would try to show that you were a part of the problem, that if you had done everything you were supposed to do, it would have alleviated the problem altogether. Your company can have losses that it can, uh, can't recover because of inadequate contracts or indemnifications, even if you escape all the liability problems. If you don't have liability problems, but you still you have a, a break in the chain of business, your competitors who were prepared will step in for you. And that's not something we want to talk about. In all of these cases, the shareholders could hold the board and the directors liable. Widespread advance notice of this problem will make it hard to show that you didn't know what was going to happen or that you couldn't take adequate measures. So the problem will be that the shareholders will come after the company and its directors and the other uh, people who suffer losses due to our breakdown in business will show that we weren't prudent business managers. How do you protect? You have to plan, plan, plan. And you have to do it concisely with due consideration for all aspects. Um, it's going to be a big project and it's going to be like putting extra insulation in your roof. It's a lot of effort, costs a lot of money, but aesthetically or business-wise, you don't get any benefit out of it other than you reduced your harm. Document, document, document. It should be like, I guess, the ISO 9000. Everything, there has to be a procedure. You have to document what you did. You have to write down what the results were so that you can show other people that you did everything that a reasonable, prudent businessman would do. And then finally, you have to budget. If you don't provide the money for the teams to do their work and you don't provide dedicated manpower adequate for the problem, you're not going to get away with it. You're going to be held liable because you didn't act as a reasonable, prudent businessman. To prove that you were prudent, that you were reasonable, to prove that you had due diligence, develop contingency plans for your core business. Make sure that you have a backup. It's going to be that one chip and one valve that doesn't open that's going to shut something down. Have to have contingency pro uh, program in place. We really follow what the SEC is coming out with. That's who we, one of our responsible parties to report to, and we're monitoring what they issue, and they're very active right now. They're following this very closely. Uh, their latest issue was a, a staff legal bulletin, a revised legal bulletin issued in January on January 12th. Grant, could you, yeah. for, for those who are non-financial, could oh, you yeah, explain the, what the SEC is and the significance of that to us because, sure. because we have a U.S. corporation? Right. It's the SEC is a Securities Exchange Commission who monitors the, the capital markets as it relates to uh, filings and any publicly traded stock, your shareholders particularly, Chevron and Texaco. And they monitor the annual reports filed. Um, they're very interested in the types of disclosures that will be in your annual report, your Form 10-Ks that your shareholders file. And attached to those reports is Caltex's financial statements. OK. Um, what they're requiring now is a disclosure in the financial statements, if the costs, 
is expected to be material or if it's a material uncertainty. Okay, and if this latest bulletin says if, if the complete assessment of how much the cost will be has not been completed, then it, you're required to make a disclosure to that effect. And I believe for cal your shareholders have already drafted their disclosures, and this last bullet is where they're fitting in. Complete assessment has not been done, that it may be a material amount, but it hasn't been assessed yet. And I would expect, although we haven't finished uh, our discussions with Nigel and the uh, controllers group, that that's where Caltech's would end up. That as of the end of 97, it's, it's a complete assessment hasn't been made. What we'll be doing, our responsibility, we have, we have to obtain an understanding of, of what you're doing and the status of, of your <coughs> activities. And we've had a lot of communication with Nigel, uh, keeping abreast of how this is progressing. One of our duties is to report to the board of directors. We actually are participating in the Caltech's board meeting this week. It's on Thursday of this week. And we have to ensure that the board of directors is informed of the status of your year 2000 issue and the status of the remediation. And if we don't feel they've been adequately informed, <coughs> we're required to inform them of how we see it progressing. So in a reportable condition, that's uh, if we see a material weakness in your control structure, that's another obligation to report. But the key is that this is something that we as accountants are now have been told we're required to communicate to the board. One thing that I want to emphasize in the work that we will be doing, I think, John, you'll agree that at the, at the end result is it's the local boards that are responsible for the programs. And you as sort of compliant officers are part of that. It's your local compliance officer which must go to your local board and attest to the local board that everything is in good shape. Now, we can help you do that. Um, my name is Richard Swanson. I'll be working with uh, Nigel and Dion Ray, and my role will be in the assessment phase of looking at what the various operating companies uh, have been doing and have done, and assessing that and then reporting that back uh, to Nigel and other folks here in Dallas. My name is Dion Ray, and I'm working with Richard Swanson and Nigel Colling, uh, and my role will be to facilitate uh, the share of information between all the opcos and also to provide assistance where required. 